Fire. And now, here's your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Welcome, welcome, friends, to the Line of Fire broadcast. Michael Brown, delighted to be with you. I can't tell you how much I look forward to starting the week together after the weekend being off the air. Here's the number to call to join in the conversation, 866-34-TRUTH, 866-348-7884. That is the number to call. My goal today is to be edifying, informative. If we do touch on some hot-button issues, my goal is to bring not just heat but light as well. 866-348-7884. Before I dive into the substance of today's broadcast, two things. First, if you're not getting the Frontline newsletter, boy, do we pour a lot into this every month to make it informational and impartational and inspirational It's yours free. It'll bless you, edify you. It's all digital, so whatever platform you have, you can read it, enjoy it, take it in, share it with others. Go to thelineoffire.org, thelineoffire.org, right in the homepage. Put your name, email, and we'll send that right out to you. When you're on the website, not while you're listening to the show, but after, explore it. We've got thousands of hours of free resources for you on a wide range of topics The second thing is that the U.N. Security Council, which is historically anti-Israel, as is the U.N. as a whole, historically mind-bogglingly anti-Israel. If you don't believe me, just look at unitednationswatch.org, unwatch.org, or check out the documentation and our hands are stained with blood, the 2019 edition. But they they voted uh, calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza during Ramadan, and so there can be more humanitarian aid coming in, and the immediate unconditional release of the hostages. Now, they didn't make the, the former conditioned on the latter. They just called for both simultaneously. And in the statement, they did not in any way blame Hamas for the humanitarian crisis in Gaza. Now, the right thing for America to do is veto it, period. Veto it. When the world is standing against Israel, America on the Security Council needed to veto. Instead, they abstained. They abstained. Now, even, even if there had said no ceasefire without the immediate and unconditional release of all hostages, that would have been one thing. But it, it doesn't say that. It just calls for them simultaneously. America said, yeah, it wasn't exactly what we wanted, but because it mentions the hostages being released and, you know, we abstained. Uh, I, I've spoke to friends in Israel today. They feel like it is yet another betrayal from America and basically telling Israel, you can't go into Rafah where the Hamas terrorists are, are, are held up. You can't go in there because it's going to create more humanitarian crisis for the, for the people of Gaza. Uh, do I care about the people of Gaza? Of course. Of course. I've said it endlessly that Palestinian blood is just as precious in God's sight as Israeli blood, that the death of a Palestinian child is just as tragic as the death of a Jewish child. I absolutely say that and hold to it. At the same time, I know that Israel will continue to do what it can to relieve the humanitarian crisis. But, hey, if Egypt opened its border, if Egypt opened its border, that would have helped. But, no, that's not going to happen under any circumstances. And, and, and if the whole world said to Hamas, Israel's going to keep coming after you until you release the hostages. Then we'll put pressure on Israel. No, but they're not saying that. They're not saying that. And that's how Israel gets Isolated. Okay, just wanted to say that, get that out of the way. Can you be a racist Christian? Can you be a follower of Jesus, a lover of the Lord, someone in whom the Spirit of God dwells as a new creation, the Word of God in your heart and mind? Can you be a racist and love Jesus at the same time? I would imagine that most would say no. Unless you say, well, you can be a Christian because anybody be a Christian doesn't depend on what you do, just on what you believe. But Let's ask it differently. Can you love Jesus? Can you be a wholehearted servant of the Lord and be a racist at the same time? Obviously not. If you say that another race is morally or spiritually inferior by their very nature, if you demonize another race and another people, whether you're demonizing blacks, whether you're demonizing whites, whether you're demonizing Jews, whether you're demonizing Italians or Chinese, whoever it is, If there is a racial, ethnic demonization of a people, if you hold to lies about that people, if you embrace falsehoods about that people to their detriment, 
if you see yourself as morally superior and degrade and demean them, obviously you can't love Jesus and do that at the same time. Now, why do I, why do I raise this issue? It's simple. And I, I may get into this on tomorrow's broadcast. We'll, we'll see. But here's a perspective I want you to have. I have focused for years on issues that come up in my own world. In other words, I've written whole books dealing with issues and concerns within the Pentecostal charismatic movement in which I, I live. Now, I minister outside of that as well. That's the primary place and circle in which I've lived for over the last 50 plus years and ministered in those circles. So that's been my primary focus. If I wanted to write whole books critiquing what's happening in the Reformed camp, the Calvinist camp, or different parts of the body, that would be easy to do. But that hasn't been my calling or focus. So it's been more looking at, at, at my house. Let, let's get the house where I live. Let's get that in order. That's been the greater focus. Then at certain times, as things come up that get my attention, or I feel the Lord calling me to respond, or many in the body say, Mike, Dr. Brown, could you respond to this? I've done it. So when John MacArthur did his Strange Fire conference in 2013 and wrote his book, Strange Fire, I felt the Lord stir my heart to write Authentic Fire. I wrote 300 pages in three weeks. Other authors collaborated with me, uh, Craig Keener, Sam Storms, and others. And we put together Authentic Fire, 450 pages from the day I started writing it to the day it was released. It was about seven weeks. Never had anything happen like that before. But I, I felt prompted to do it in response to what I felt were false and destructive charges. I don't need anyone's help to critique issues and errors that I see in, in, in the, the family where, where I live, okay? We're doing that. I'm doing that on a very regular basis, in videos and articles and books. But when someone says things that I believe are wrong or erroneous or, or detrimental, then I'll respond. So more recently, it's been a push for cessationism. Christianity Today reached out to me asking if I wanted to write a response to this new push for cessationism or a cessationist movie that, that some preview of it, but now officially coming out next year or a cessationism conference is being widely announced. So I'm, I'm responding to these things and then being invited with Brandon Kimber to be part of, the, of American Gospel 3. Uh, and if I didn't agree with the ultimate direction and where I was included, I would step out of it, which, which I did as per our written agreement. However, because I recorded more than 12 hours of material, after going back and forth a lot, I said, okay, release all of that. So in the future, it should be the very near future, there'll be like four hours of dialogue with me and Doug Gavett and Holly Pivik talking about so-called NAR. There's a real NAR and there's the fictional NAR, and that's what I was trying to, to distinguish between. So that'll all be released. The four-hour roundtable with Sam Storms um, and I uh, dialoguing with Justin Peters and Jim Osmond, that's out. And then over four hours of simply me responding to questions that Brandon asked, that should be released in the future as well. So now that all this is out, it's caused a fresh wave of responding. And all I've called for is very simple. All I've called for is equal weights and equal measures. That's all I've called for. I may get into this more tomorrow. We'll see. Where I'm going to explain why I don't cater to the critics why the critics cannot set the agenda for my life or calling or ministry. But as we've dialogued, that's been my call. I believe it was Rabbi Yitz Greenberg who said, it's not right to take the best of our religion and compare it to the worst of someone else's religion. Let's do it equally. If you're gonna say, well, radical Islam is wrong for this reason, this reason, this reason, okay, well, let's find the worst aspects of Christian faith and, and critique honestly. Or let's see what, what are worst and best aspects, or what's see what is the actual see what is the actual heart of that faith. So that's been my issue. That's why I brought up Martin Luther, which I brought up previously in my strange uh, my response to Strange Fire and Authentic Fire, saying, "Hey, you critique charismatics over X Y Z and give others a pass." So what we've heard is, yeah, but but Luther was a product of his time. Well, of course, we're all products of our time. So that begs the question, what if you lived in a day where many Christians in America believed that the black race was morally and spiritually inferior? Could you love Jesus and hold to that at the same time? That's the question. We, we began to address it last Wednesday. I was going to go to the phones and due to a mishap, all internet in the building went out where I was broadcasting from Dallas, never got to the phone. So we're going to continue that today, let some folks kind of 
air things out. But but I, I want to give you an example of something. OK, somebody tagged me on Facebook. I don't see ninety nine percent of posts, ninety nine point nine percent of posts and comments. But someone tagged me and I saw this one and it was a picture of, of Benny Hinn, a recent show like a day or two ago. And, and there is the caption, time to buy heavenly oil for your lamp. All right. It's time to buy heavenly oil for your lamp. And the person tags me and Sam Storms and says, oh, yeah, Benny Hens a brother. Right. OK, so that that statement there. First, I don't even know what it means. It's time to buy heavenly oil for your lamp. I don't know what it means. But if it's suggesting that by donating money, you are getting heavenly oil or something like that, obviously manipulative, obviously wrong, obviously foolhardy. Do I believe that as, as you, you sow and you bless other ministries and you give to the poor and you help that, that you store up treasure in heaven? In the process, sure, the word's clear on that. But whatever that, whatever that caption is, to me, is, is utterly ridiculous. The, the excellent chances that Benny Hinn never even saw it himself, had nothing to do with it, that someone just posted it from his ministry. Okay, greater oversight, fine. But I actually, I wanted to see what was on the video. I thought, okay, let's see how terrible and horrific this fundraising video is. What it was, was him talking with his son-in-law, Michael Koulianos, about Jesus' image and about what God's doing there and about the spiritual hunger of the young people. And now this is the horrific, terrible, heretical fundraising. Let's listen at the end of that 30-minute broadcast. But well, it's time to give to the Lord's work. The information is on the screen for you. You can sow your seed right now on the platform or go to, the, to our website or you can text. That, that was it. That was the horrific, demonic, terrible fundraising, the manipulative, twisting fundraising. So here's the thing. I'm looking at it because our ministry, different people post things for me. No, no one's going to post buy oil for your heavenly lamp, right? But they may post something I didn't even know. Then you find out afterwards, you say, oh, that's no good. Change it. But you get a certain impression looking at it. I thought there's a half hour of carnal manipulative fundraising. Instead, that was, that was the fundraising at the end of the broadcast. All I'm saying is, what are we doing? Analyze it fairly. Analyze it fairly. You say, well, you're giving him a pass. Ah, that's where you're missing it. Stay here, and you're about to hear some mind-boggling things. Don't go anywhere. This is Michael Ellison, founder of Trivita Wellness. I want to introduce our Trivita Alfred Libby original patented sublingual B12, B6, and folate formula. I had the wonderful opportunity of meeting Alfred Libby, a pioneer in vitamin research. I also had the opportunity to obtain the patented formula, and the rest is history, with over 50 million tablets being taken by our Trivita members through the years. The amazing testimonies of mental clarity, mood enhancement, and more energy have been thrilling to me as a founder of Trivita Wellness. Not only is it an amazing B12 product, but it is loaded with the essential B6 vitamin. I call it the workhorse vitamin. It is vital for strong immune function and every body system. Here's what the National Center for Biotechnology Information says, and I quote, it plays a key role and is crucial to immune function. It is a molecule necessary for the proper functioning of the entire body system, and its role cannot be overestimated. Harvard Medical School of Health says, Folate is the natural form of vitamin B9, and it plays a key role in breaking down homocysteine, an amino acid that can exert harmful effects on the body when it is present in high amounts. I encourage you today to try the Trivita Libby B12, B6, and folate formula. To order Alfred Libby's B12 for yourself, call 1-800-771-5584 or online at trivita.com. Order today and use promo code BROWN25 to receive 25% off your order. As a new customer, 100% of your order proceeds from your first order will go to support the Line of Fire radio broadcast. 1-800-771-5584 or online at trivita.com. 
It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get on the Line of Fire by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Thanks, friends, for joining us. Shout out to our co-sponsor, Trivita, who helps us do what we're doing right now. Yeah, all of you should be appreciative to Trivita. They help pay our radio bills through their generosity as they help get you healthier, too. So check out their great wellness resources, 800-771-5584, 800-771-5584, or Trivita.com. Use the code BROWN25 for your maximum discount and to guarantee 100% of your first order and more than a tithe of all subsequent orders will be donated to help us reach more people on the Line of Fire broadcast. What a, what a great partnership. It blesses me every day. All right. <clears throat> Can you be a Christian and a racist? Now, here's the deal. When I have sat with critics, people with burdens, concerns, maybe they wouldn't call themselves critics, and saying, Dr. Brown, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. You should call out this person, this person, this person, this person. And when I say, well, I haven't studied their writings, well, how ma- all of you who study the people that you want me to critique, how many books have you written in the last few years on Jewish ministry? How many commentaries of the Bible have you written? How many books have you written on the culture wars? You say, well, that's not, that's not my calling, Dr. Brown. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough, I'm busy doing all those things and I can't stop and follow somebody else's agenda. You say, well, here, Dr. Brown, we're presenting you with the evidence. Could be, and here's what I say, if the evidence you're presenting me is accurate, if the person teaches those things and practices those things that you allege, then the person is a false teacher or then the person is a heretic. Simple, simple, no mystery, simple. The reason I don't just say it immediately is because I've seen people misquote me. I've seen people misrepresent me. I've seen people post falsehoods about me. In fact, it's day and night of video compilations. I don't watch all the stuff that comes out attacking me, but I've seen misleading stuff left and right, left and right for years. So I'm not just going to believe what someone else says about another person, nor should you. You should do the research for yourself. So here... I've had people writing me say, Dr. Brown, have you watched Benny Hinn recently? No, I, I don't. I don't watch Christian TV. I, I don't have time. Have you watched him preaching on holiness and preaching on the centrality of Jesus and abiding in Christ and turning from sin and giving clear altar calls? And he's done that for years now and said he said a lot of wrong things in the past. He was immature and wrong. No, I haven't seen that either. I haven't seen either. So all I'm saying is if evidence I'm being presented with is accurate, and the person holds to certain things, I would call that person heretical, right? The question is, why don't we use the same standards for everyone? You might have seen that Benny Hinn thing and thought that's a 30-minute fundraiser and all that. Someone from his staff may have posted something on Facebook. I I don't imagine he sees the captions that are put up there. So I'm first and foremost holding him responsible for his words. That was the terrible fundraiser. Now, let's, let's shift gears for a minute. All I want is equal weights and measures. If you're going to explain, well, look, this, this person, they were racist, but they were a product of their times. Okay, those who preach prosperity, they're a product of their times too. And they believe that this mentality that we never have enough and that Christians just live in perpetual debt, and the poorer you are, the holier you are, we never have money to help and, and support the gospel. Right? That's a destructive mentality. And there's so many promises in the word about God's abundance. And as, as we sow generously, we reap generously. That's what Paul writes. And, and as we honor the Lord with the first fruits of, of our of our giving and, and income that God pours out blessing, that's what Proverbs says, and on and on. So we cultivate generosity, we encourage generosity, and we believe as God prospers us that we sow more into the gospel, and, 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 and some people go to extremes with it, but hey, they're products of their environment. Where, where does one draw the line? Where does one draw the line? So I, I want to read a few quotes. I read them uh, on Wednesday, but I want to read these and then play a clip from Phil Johnson, then we'll go to the phones. Phil Johnson, a longtime colleague of Pastor MacArthur. Robert Dabney, who Johnson said is his favorite theologian, John MacArthur quotes left and right, loves Dabney, said he was like a Puritan living in the 1800s. Uh, he was pro-slavery and a Southern Presbyterian. In his book, A Defense of Virginia, he wrote, was it nothing that this race, speaking of blacks, morally inferior, should be brought into close relations to a nobler race, the white race, so that 
The propensity to imitation should be stimulated by constant intimate observation, by domestic affection, by the powerful sentiment of allegiance and dependence. In other words, when the slaves see the godliness of their white masters, that will make them want to be like us and follow Jesus. As to the idea that slavery enabled rape and other forms of sexual morality, Dabney said, no, no, because blacks, whites would no way want to be with this inferior race. And it goes on and on, quote after quote. So I just want you to hear what Phil Johnson said about Robert Dabney, and then I'll give my punchline, and then we'll go to the phones. Let's listen. One of my favorite theologians uh, in America is R.L. Dabney. He was a Presbyterian theologian, and I firmly believe that he would be remembered as America's greatest theologian ever, except that he got embroiled in the Civil War. He was a Southern Presbyterian during the time of the Civil War. He was the, the chaplain to uh, Stonewall Jackson. So he was actually in the military and fought uh, for the South in the war. And when the South lost, he became embittered and never really got over it. And some of his later writings also are racist, you know, just racist. And so much so that when uh, the Banner of Truth published his collected writings on essays and stuff like that, it's called Discussions. It's actually my favorite set of books. Of all the books on my shelf, that's the one I would least like to, to lose because there's some just brilliant material in there. But when Banner of Truth, it was originally four volumes, and when Banner of Truth picked it up and published it, they made it three volumes because they took out, there was so much racist material at the end that they had to take out. Uh, so they deleted half of volume three and most of volume four and put it in three volumes. Uh, and I look at Dabney and I think, what a shame. What a shame. I mean, he was a product of his times. Uh, and what a shame that he couldn't rise above that and see beyond that because he understood doctrine and loved the scriptures and loved Christ. And, and I'm sure his level of spiritual maturity was far beyond mine. So. Uh, I, I feel bad even criticizing him, but you have to step back and look at that and say, he, like, like all those reformers, was a flawed man. And sometimes our flaws outlive uh, and sometimes even overshadow our good qualities. Yeah, so, friends, when you hear Phil Johnson bash charismatics and say that that the vast, 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 vast majority of charismatics worldwide are, are, are not saved or hellbound, and bash this one as a false teacher and that one as a false prophet, etc. Just remember that he gives Dabney a pass. That's my issue. It's the unequal weights and measures, and I see it day and night with the anti-charismatic critics. Unequal weights and measures. You say, well, Luther was a product of his times. Hey, Nobody was writing what he was writing in church circles in, in the 1500s about the Jews. Historian Paul Johnson says that even for his day, he stood out. And remember, Luther had enough insight in 1523 to write a very positive tract of, about the Jewish people and, and repent of the sins of the church against the Jews, only to do something far worse than the Catholic Church had advocated, to do that 20 years later. Oh, but he was a product of his times. So a modern-day preacher, charismatic, who, who may preach a wrong emphasis on prosperity or who may have something wrong on the atonement. No, they're hellbound. They're absolutely hellbound. They're sinners. They're false teachers. They're deceivers, period, and over. But yeah, you can be a racist and fight for the South in the Civil War, and, and you have so much racist material that more than one volume of your four-volume set has to be completely removed. But that person loved Christ and was deeply mature spiritually. That is the stuff that must be called out. These horrific double standards. Let us be consistent before God. And let us be consistent in a way that is honorable and truthful before God. Because the way we judge others is the way that we ourselves are going to be judged. All right, we'll go to the phones when we come back. 866-348-7884. And those who differ with me. You can blast me all over YouTube and X and Facebook and wherever. I, I don't see the post for the most part. But why not call? Let's have a conversation. 866-348-7884. 
Hey friends, Michael Brown here. My delight to serve as your voice for moral sanity and spiritual clarity. We are living in such urgent times today, friends, that all of us are in the line of fire. There's a target on your back. There's a target on my back. If you simply seek to live by biblical values or just conservative moral values, you could be canceled. You could be cast out. You could be put down. You could be silenced. I'm here to say, friends, that I am not about to be silenced, and I don't believe you are either. It is time for us to stand up. It is time for us to say enough is enough. It is time for us to push back in Jesus' name. Not fighting the way the world fights. No, overcoming evil with good, overcoming hatred with love, overcoming the flesh with the power of the spirit, overcoming lies with truth. And that's what we're here to do on the Line of Fire broadcast. And friends, it's not just a broadcast. It is a movement of people around the world. God's people standing up saying enough is enough and saying, Lord, here we are. Send us, use us. I want to urge you today to join our support team because we are on the front lines together. And we are literally touching people around the world, in America, in the nations, in Israel. And together with your help, we're going to amplify this voice and spread this movement around the globe. So I encourage you, go right now to thelineoffire.org, thelineoffire.org. Click Donate Monthly Support, thelineoffire.org. Click Donate Monthly Support. When you do, you become a torchbearer. We immediately send you two great life-changing books. We immediately give you access to many classes I've taught. Others have to pay to take those. You get them for free. Exclusive video audio content, a new audio message every month, an insider prayer newsletter, 15% discount on our online bookstore, so much more. Join our support team today. Go to thelineoffire.org. Donate monthly support. This is how we rise up. It's The Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get on The Line of Fire by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Thanks, friends, for joining us on The Line of Fire, 866-34-TRUTH. My own view is that it is possible to live in a certain environment where you are that blinded to various realities that you never rise above them, even though you know the Lord. So I'm not saying Dabney was hellbound, and I'm not saying that, that an anti-charismatic who denies what the Holy Spirit is doing around the world today, touching hundreds of millions of people in dramatic ways with with whole books filled with incredible documented miracles, with, with literally hundreds of millions of testimonies to what the Holy Spirit's doing today. And yet there are some that vehemently deny it, say none of it is the Lord. I'm not saying they're hellbound. I'm saying they are also products of their environment and spiritually blind in certain ways. And we all have a blind spot somewhere. However, if you're going to damn one person to hell for preaching prosperity, or damn someone else to hell for not tre- preaching a certain doctrine I'm to do with atonement or trinity in a fully orthodox way, well, then you're going to damn the racist to hell. Are, are, are you going to damn the, the Jew baiter to hell? Where, where to draw the line then if you're going to excuse one and give the others a pass? All right, uh, let's go to our buddy Seiko in Houston. We never met face to face, have we? No, Dr. Brown, we have never met face-to-face, just, just online, but I do appreciate it. And, uh, again, thank you for taking the time to take my call. So greetings to you. And also uh, a mutual friend, Pastor Fred Price, you wanted, us to, wanted me to send you his hello as well, too. All right. So what's on your mind? You, you actually were the one that sent me the Dabney link and the Phil Johnson link. This is, this is not to attack Phil Johnson. We, we've had our strong differences in, in the past. But it, it's simply, again, to raise the question of unequal weights and measures. I'm going to let you speak in a minute. But Matthew 18, remember, that's the parable where Jesus talks about the man who's for, forgiven a massive debt uh, by the king. And then he turns around and, and refuses to forgive a minor debt to someone else. And when the king finds out, he, he's furious and he puts him in prison because he didn't forgive the way he was forgiven. So what, what's your take on all this? Go ahead, weigh in. Yeah, so my take on it is, and I'm I'm coming from a place where, um, well, let me first of all say this to you. I want to I want to publicly thank you, and also Dr. Sam Storms uh, in the roundtable discussion that you had with Justin Peters and also Jim Osmond. 
um, I want to just say thank you for for publicly uh, when you had found out about the the, the unfortunate uh, scandal regarding Mike Bickle, you and Dr. Storms both had publicly denounced it and both publicly stated that you did not know uh, then what you knew now, and you, uh, you 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 sent your 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 heartfelt feelings and, and, and heartbroken condolences to those who are affected by it. But you distanced yourself from that from the individual who, at the time, you all did not know was doing these things. And unfortunately, that's not that's not what's going on. And I'll just use this in the, in, the, in a theological standpoint. That's not what's going on in our reform circles, uh, Dr. Brown. And so for me, I hate and I detest favoritism in all its shapes, form, and fashions. And that is happening in our in our in our circles today. When you can have individuals that are in the reform camp know that uh, people like, Dr., like like John MacArthur, and I'm just just, just stating facts. This is not this is not a rumor or anything like that. These these are court documented transcripts and records where a woman was put out of the church by the name of Eileen Gray put out of the church because she was abused by her husband who was on staff. Children were, and I was going to use the initials S.A. because I want to have, you know, YouTube, you know, flag anything like that. But there, but the children were assaulted by the father. The father is in prison right now for 21 years to life. His his parole hearing was, was, was denied because of the egregious crime that he committed against his own children. John MacArthur's church, Grace Community Church, still supported this man financially, tried to hide it until Julie Royce had broke the story and exposed him. But you don't hear Phil Johnson, you don't hear Vody Bakum, you don't hear Justin Peters, you don't hear any of these guys mentioning any of this stuff, and they know this is true, and they say nothing about it. That That is unjust weights and measures. That's, that's partiality, that is fear of man, and that is sin. And so for me, I, I want to call balls, balls, and strike strikes. And so I just have to commend you, brothers, for that, because that's what's needed, not just on the quote-unquote charismatic side, Dr. Brown, but that's needed on, on the reform side on, on, and anybody that names the name of Christ. Because there's too many people out here in these church circles that have platforms and positions that are not speaking out against the sin, and particularly of white supremacy, racism, uh, in any of these things that we see that is going on in our circles today. So people that want to say, like, like, like Phil Johnson mentioned, that R.L. Dabney was a, a product of his time. Do you know Dr. Brown? Who else was a product of, of, of their times? Um, Alexander McLeod. He was a Presbyterian minister. He spoke out against the very practice of, of chattel slavery that R.L. Dabney supported and advocated for. Another individual that some people may know was Nathan Bedford Forrest. Nathan, Nathan Bedford Forrest was born in the same time and generation as R.L. Dabney. He was a, he was a, a general, I believe he was. Uh, but nonetheless, he was a racist until God saved him. I just want to read a portion, if you don't mind, Dr. Brown, because Go ahead. This, this needs to get out. Go ahead. But people can see the, the saving, transforming power of God. When God saves the individual from their sin, it changes. It should change their disposition, their attitude towards their fellow man. And anyone that supports or excuses chattel slavery shows hatred toward their toward fellow image bearers and R.L. Dabney hated fellow image bearers of Christ. He supported their enslavement, he, he supported their abuse, and even taught that they were less than human. How can you be a Christian and teach that? Because we say that then, Dr. Brown, what we're telling people, we owe, we owe the homosexual or the sodomite or the pedophile an apology, that they can be those things and still be named a Christian. And I think that would be an insult against the gospel, against the spirit of God, and against what we preach and teach in, in, our, in our churches today. But I just want to read this to you, and just for, for those who are watching and listening in their hearing. This is, this is Nathan Bedford Forrest's biography. It's titled Nathan Bedford Forrest's Redemption. This is what it says, quote, it says that Nathan Bedford Forrest of 1865 was obviously not the same man who stood before the pole bearers in 1875. His words on that day speak volumes about God's ability to change a man completely. And though many to this day malign Forrest for his past sins, his redemption is undoubtedly manifest in the words he spoke. After being presented a bouquet of flowers as a gift of reconciliation, here it is, Dr. Brown, between the races by a young black lady named Lou Lewis, the aging and feeble general spoke, slowly excuse me, arose and spoke saying, quote, this is what he said. Ladies and gentlemen, I accept the flowers as a memento of reconciliation between the white and colored race. Accept it more particularly as it comes from a colored lady. 
For if there was anyone of, on God's green earth who loved the ladies, I believe it is myself. And people started to laugh. He said, I came here with the jeers of some white people who think that I am doing wrong. I believe I can exert some influence and do much to assist the people in strengthening fraternal relations and shall do in all my power to alleviate every man to depress none. I want to alleviate you to take positions in law offices, in stores, on farms, and wherever you are capable of going. I have not, I have not said anything about politics today. I don't, I don't propose to say anything about politics. You have a right to elect from who you please, vote for the man you think best. And I think when that is done, you and I are free men. Do as you consider right and honest in electing in office. I do not come here to make you a long speech, although invited to do so by you. I am much more of a speaker, and my business prevented me from preparing myself. I came to meet you as friends and welcome you to the white people. I want you to come near us. When I can serve you, I will do so. I have but one flag, one country. Let us stand together. We may differ mm. in color, but not in sentiment. Many things have been said about me which are wrong and which white and black persons here who stood by me through the war can contradict. Go, go to work, be industrious, live honestly, and act truly. And when you are oppressed, I will come to your relief. I thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for this opportunity you have afforded me to be with you and to assure you that I am with you in heart and in mm -hmm. hand. And when he said this, he went, he went over to the lady and kissed her on her cheek, Dr. Brown, this black lady. What yeah, so, so for that, that, yeah, so, so just, to, just to jump in, friends, the, the point is that we can be products of our times. What about uh, a progressive or liberal pastor? who says abortion is right or good, or, or we need to transition children, et cetera. Well, they're products of their times. What I don't understand is how you could truly meet with God and really know the Lord and not be changed. You know, I find it interesting when you mention, uh, you know, again, the issue of fairness and, and equal standards. So think of Charles Finney, who really opposed the militant Calvinism of his day, which had become totally passive. There's nothing you can do to save anyone or say just God does what he's going to do when he's going to do it. So Finney would not serve you communion. If you were in his church in New York, you had anything to do with the slave trade. Finney, actually, when he was at Oberlin College, that was one of the Underground Railroad routes for, for slaves that were freeing, uh, that, that were fleeing. And so, but Finney gets bashed because he wasn't a Calvinist. Like, but, but hang on, you had a, you had a Calvinist who was a racist, and, or you have all the founders of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary who were all slaveholders and who justified right. slavery. You have the birth of the Southern Baptists to break away from Northern Baptists because they that's wanted right. to keep their slaves. But that's okay because their theology was good. No, no, you, you, can't, you can't do it like that. You can't measure it like that. By the way, you mentioned Pastor MacArthur. Julie Royce urged me the other day to call these things out, urged me. She said they, they are incredibly well documented. So just if you want to search, go to julieroyce.com. I, I don't like everything that's posted there, but go to julieroyce.com. There's a lot of good that's been done as well. And just search for it, John MacArthur, right. julieroyce.com, John MacArthur. And the same people condemning Mike Bickle for everything that, that witnesses say he did, which we have publicly said disqualifies him from ministry for life. Heartbreaking, terrible, because we never saw these things in him. But the same ones that are bashing all charismatics and you see, you see, you see. Well, just go ahead and search Julie Royce's website for John, John MacArthur and just see what comes up there. No, not that he's done these things, but, he, but even writing to a woman who's saying, look, my father abused me when he was a boy, and you're still standing with him, and he's still serving, and him saying, well, why are you bringing this up all these years later? You know, th this is kind of mind-boggling stuff. So let us be consistent. That is the plea. Let us be consistent before God, because he's going, he's, he's not looking the other way as we are condemning the people outside of our camp, but excusing the ones within our camp. Let us be consistent before God. Hey, brother, I know this is a major burden you've carried, so I just wanted you to get, get out, share what you did. And there are people who were pro-slavery, racists, that really met with the Lord and changed. Thank you for the call. God bless you, my brother. Thank you, brother.
I'm Paul Burnett, a board-certified doctor of holistic health. Over the years, I have helped countless people increase and maintain their natural energy production with Alfred Libby's Slow Dissolve Super B12, sold only by Trivita. I have never met anyone deficient in caffeine or sugar, but I have met many people deficient in energy-supporting vitamin B12. Vitamin B12 is one of the eight B vitamins and is an essential nutrient, meaning the body cannot make B12 on its own. You see, unlike other oral B12 supplements, Alfred Libby's Slow Dissolve Super B12 is fast-acting because the formula is scientifically developed to dissolve under the tongue, bypassing the digestive process, making it immediately available for use in the body. Alfred Livy's Slow Dissolve Super B12 is also formulated with other natural energy supporting ingredients, such as folate, ginseng root, and other natural ingredients. Not only are the ingredients beneficial for energy, but they also support healthy cognition, mood, nerve function, and natural hemoglobin production. You deserve to live with greater energy and mental clarity. And now, like millions of others, you can with Alfred Livy's Slow Dissolve Super B12, sold only by your wellness partner, Trivita. To order Alfred Libby's B12 for yourself, call 1-800-771-5584 or online at Trivita.com. Order today and use promo code BROWN25 to receive 25% off your order. As a new customer, 100% of your order proceeds from your first order will go to support the Line of Fire radio broadcast. Call 1-800-771-5584. 1-800-771-5584 or online at Trivita.com. It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get on the Line of Fire by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Thanks, friends, for joining us on the Line of Fire, 866-34-TRUTH. Uh, can I encourage all of us to cultivate greater humility? and to get lower before the Lord. There are no big shots. There are no superstars. We're all servants. Any good thing that comes through any of us that's from the Lord, and he gets the credit and the glory, you can appreciate people who've served. You can give proper honor. But let's remember there is only one God who receives worship. There is only one Lord to whom we bow down. Let us not exalt people. Let, let us not exalt names and movements. Let us exalt Jesus as Lord. And let's walk with humility. Just like when you drive, you learn as a new driver, you have a blind spot. You, know, you look out your side view mirror, everything's good. You start to move into the next lane. Someone lays on the horn. Oh, they were in your blind spot. So that's the nature of a blind spot. You don't know what's there. So what do you do? You compensate. You look over your shoulder, right? Or your car has a mechanism where it, it warns you if there's a car next to you in the lane. So how do we look over our shoulder, so to say, in terms of doctrine, practice, belief, where you cultivate humility before the Lord, you do your best to be teachable and receive input from others, and you scrutinize yourself before God. You lay on your face, say, God, show me. Show me anything displeasing. Show me anything I'm missing. Bring people into my life to help me to see. Open your words so I can see. Speak to me. Correct me. You do your best. You re-examine positions, and, and there are hills I'll die on, non-negotiable hills I'll die on, that I, I could not deny those truths or, or deny those convictions any more than I could deny my own existence. And there are other things where, hey, we have differences and different perspectives, and let's walk as graciously as we can towards one another. About to go to the phones, 866-34-TRUTH if you want to weigh in. But just to, to give you... One more example. George Whitfield, one of the greatest preachers in church history, lived from 1714 to 1770, convert, younger, uh, younger colleague of John and Charles Wesley. Although he came to faith, he was born again. They, he was working with them as in part of this Methodist movement that was growing out of this holiness movement that came from the Wesley brothers. Uh, but he wasn't saved yet. None of them were saved yet. Whitfield got born again first. And then Whitfield and Wesley had a temporary separation because Whitfield was a Calvinist, Wesley was an Arminian, and they reconciled. Many of their followers never reconciled, but they did. But Whitfield was mightily used in the First Great Awakening. 
Whitfield was not aware of the horrors of mental passage. Whitfield was not aware of some of the barbaric, inexcusable, demonic, inhuman aspects of the slave trade, which are absolutely worthy of condemnation. He thought, now that the slaves are here, as long as you treat them well and then offer them the gospel, that it's good that they're here. So he was not anti-slavery. It was a blind spot for Whitfield. I don't believe he went to hell over it, but it was a blind spot. What blind spots might we have? Uh, I might challenge many Christian leaders who were silent on abortion, silent on the culture wars, and I'm sure some can challenge me on different areas. Let's humble ourselves because we're all products of our times, and, and that has benefit and that has some real danger as well. Look, we're Westerners, if you're listening here in America. We're Westerners. We think a certain way. We don't think the way ancient Israelites would have thought in corporate terms, in tribal terms. That doesn't mean our way of thinking is right or better. I go on and on with examples like this, but all I'm asking for once again is equal weights and measures. Equal weights and measures. Let's just be consistent across the board. That is pleasing to God. He hates unequal weights and unequal measures. All right, let's go to the phones in Lynchburg, Virginia. Cliff, welcome to the line of fire. Hey, Dr. Brown, how's it going? Very well, thank you, sir. Uh, I'm dealing, something I've been dealing with for a while is just uh, just a race issue in general. Um, it, it tears me apart, um, but I've, I dealt just too much in political uh, aspects of things uh, before I really uh, committed myself to Christ and everything, and um, just just learning like crime statistics and everything. You know, 13 percent population commits 60 percent of the crime. I read the bell curve and everything. Um, in no way am I saying that the black race is inferior to the white man, but um, you see these things, and it's just. Why do you think that's the case? Yeah, Cliff, why do you think uh, a disproportionate amount of crimes are committed by black Americans? Why do you think that's the case? Uh, Fatherlessness in the homes, which was uh, perpetuated by the Great Society, uh, created by Lyndon Baines Johnson. All right. And and any other factors that you think might contribute to that? Uh, pretty much no. I mean, without the father in the home, you destroy the structure of the family. Right, right. So, um, so fatherless just, homes is, is massive, but the, the question might be, and, and certainly before the civil rights movement, great society, welfare, all of that, before that, you had uh, more stability in African-American households, etc. I don't know why that yeah, music is... Were doing, yeah, blacks were doing better before the right, right, right. Movement, which is crazy. Yeah, but, but the, point, the point I was going to make was this, sir, that you cannot downplay the horrific legacy of slavery and segregation in America. In other words, this is our problem as Americans. Fatherlessness in black homes, to me, that is our problem here in America. And... Uh, do I believe, and we need to stop and make reparations now, no, that's not my position. Do I believe that CRT and DEI and these things are terribly detrimental the way they're being inf- uh, implemented on our college campuses and places of business? Absolutely. Do I believe that America has been terribly racist from the womb, that from 1619 on America existed with the goal of perpetuating slavery and the whole reason for the war of independence was to perpetuate slavery. No, I don't believe any of that stuff at all. I do believe that there are lasting effects of our racism, that there are effects that remain to this day, that you cannot have slavery for that long, followed by segregation for that long in much of the country, with the result that today the average net worth of a black family, not talking about a a family coming over from Africa in this generation, but a historic family, so African-American that have been here in this country for generations, came over as slaves, so the descendants through the generations. So on average, the average net worth of a black family is much less than the average net worth of a white family. That has to do with the history. I do not believe that we should strive for equal outcomes 
because you, you cannot have that with human beings and different ones working harder and making greater efforts, et cetera. But we should strive for equal opportunity and do what we can to level the playing field. Look, there is the line that the Democrats first wanted black uh, bodies. Now they want black souls for the purpose of black votes, hence the welfare system, great society, all these things, and that the black American family was much more stable before these things were implemented than after. We'll let others more expert on that sort those things out. But, but here's, here's the key thing. What, what, where were, say, Southern Baptists? Okay, uh, there are many, many fine Southern Baptists. Some of the great Christian leaders in America today are Southern Baptists. People who, whose writings, whose messages have, have blessed millions of people, okay? But if you go back to the days of segregation, the Southern Baptists were pro-segregation. Were they all hellbound sinners? Was every one of them hellbound because of it? I would think that some of them raised in that environment and not breaking through into a deeper relationship with God were saved and, and guilty of something very significant. And, and the, same, the same, same way, when you come from a certain spiritual environment, your level of maturity in your environment may be like a baby in another environment. So we, don't excuse, we do not excuse sin. We do not excuse sin, period. If someone is preaching a carnal prosperity message and telling you Jesus died with the purpose of making you financially rich and financial riches are a sign of your spirituality, that is a detestable doctrine. That is a destructive doctrine, and it robs the gospel of its meaning and its power. Absolutely, inexcusably wrong. However, if you say, well, the person's a product of their times, and that's kind of a message they learned is because they, they were combating a message where you know Christianity and poverty went hand in hand, and the poorer you were, the holier you were, and you never have any money to give and support the gospel. Now we have an abundance to give. <laughs> okay, so we don't excuse the thing. We say, well, that's the environment they came from. Let's fix it. Let's fix it. When you're talking about people from the past, Unless you confront these things, unless you openly address these things, unless you say that racism is uh, here, I don't understand. Say it like this. I don't understand how Dabney could have such theological insight, if that's what you believe, and have loved Jesus with all his heart and yet said that blacks were morally inferior by God's will, by God's design. I don't see how someone can say that. I find it deeply contradictory and it troubles me to the point I have a hard time reading those books. Th that, that makes sense. You're not damning him to hell, but I don't understand how that can be, how you can be that much a product of your environment. Because if you really walk with the Lord, deeply enough, he's going to open your eyes. He's going to convict you. He's going to show you. Let us simply be consistent in what we say and what we do because we're going to stand before God, all of us, one day and give account.